In Prattville, Alabama, in 2001, for Shannon Polk, it was any other summer. The days were hot and in August, specifically unforgiving. Shannon was like any other 11-year-old. She loved her friends and her neighbors. She was outgoing and bubbly. She loved playing outside. She really was just like any other kid. Shannon was getting ready to go back to school soon. She would have started middle school. Shannon and her family had made a trip recently to Montgomery, Alabama to go shopping. She was excited for her future and had no reason to think that anyone would take it from her. But what would happen to her would haunt this community for the next 20 years. Shannon lived in Candlestick Mobile Home Park. This park had at least 200 residents at the time. There was a play area and a pond with a fountain. It was a nice community then, or it had seemed that way on the outside. Each road in the park is named after a baseball team. The main road running through most of the park is Dodgers. Shannon lived towards the back of the park on Expos Court. But a lot of the action that we'll be discussing today will happen around the pond. Shannon was peacefully sleeping on the couch when her mother left early for work on the 16th. It was a warm Thursday summer morning in Prattville. Marie, Shannon's mother, was up early to take her baby nephew back to his parents' house before she went into work. She said she gave Shannon a kiss on her forehead, gentle enough not to wake her, and she left to start her day. According to some, Shannon was supposed to be grounded that day and was not allowed to play outside. However, there was also a baby walker that she was supposed to bring home from someone's house in the mobile home park that day. And this walker could prove to be very important for her case. She carried it with her throughout the mobile home park on the afternoon that she disappeared. And where it ended up could be useful in figuring out who potentially took her and from where. Once her mother left for work, it was just Shannon and her older sister Lisa left at home. Shannon's mom and dad had just divorced in the last six months, and he was living in a different town, almost two hours away. So it was not out of the ordinary for Shannon to be left with her 16-year-old sister, Lisa. School was still out for summer, and Shannon regularly played with the neighborhood children all day. By the time Shannon's sister, Lisa, had woken up, around 9 a.m., the TV was loud and Shannon was already gone. It looked like she had made herself some breakfast and headed out for the day. And this is unconfirmed, but Shannon was said to have visited a friend at 7.45 that morning. She wanted to see if she could come out and play with her, but the girl reportedly told her that she couldn't, and Shannon went on her way. This was believed to be her first stop before she went to retrieve the baby walker. At approximately 10 a.m., Shannon's neighbor on Met Street said that she spent about half an hour with Shannon while her child slept in the other room. She said that Shannon had asked her if she would take her up to the gas station to buy some candy. This neighbor told her that she could after her child woke up from their nap. But Shannon left and went over to another friend's house around 11.45 to see if they were able to come out and play. However, this girl had a doctor's appointment, so she had to tell Shannon no. But these neighbors reported seeing her with that walker. And Miss Mary lived on the main circle of the park. 
The house that Shannon had just knocked on was just across the little pond with the fountain from her house. She could clearly see Shannon walking away from her friend's house with that walker on her head. She then reportedly went over to the Halloween man's house and knocked on his door, but he was not home. This was strange, though, because Shannon was not exactly friendly with this man. They knew him as the Halloween man because he would decorate his yard for Halloween for some kind of charity event every year. Some neighbors reported him being a bit of a strange individual. Nothing that raised any red flags, though. The last place that Shannon was seen before she disappeared was at a neighbor's house, just one house over from her own. And this neighbor was a police officer who lived there with his wife and two boys. She had recently rescued a puppy, but she couldn't keep it. And these neighbors were caring for the dog. And Shannon was likely going over there to see the animal she had rescued. However, the officer said that he was getting ready for work. And they had a rule that they couldn't have friends come in without their mother home. So they sent her on her way. This is the last time anyone would speak to Shannon. during this time, noon to 1.15 p.m., that Shannon was believed to have been abducted. Several neighbors were home, but they didn't hear any kind of commotion outside. People who knew Shannon said she would not have gotten into a car with someone she didn't know. But because no one heard anything, no screams, no screeching tires, and no strange vehicles prowling through the neighborhood, even with the knowledge that it very well may have been a stranger that took her. Neighbors and others close to Shannon believed that a neighbor or someone she knew had to have done something to her. Around 1.15, the police officer leaves for work. And on his way out of the mobile home park, he notices the walker that Shannon had was sitting on the curb right outside of the Halloween man's house. Another neighbor, not knowing that the walker could be potential evidence in any crime, grabbed it off the street. She was pregnant and she thought that someone had thrown it away and she got lucky and got a free baby walker. But the woman unfortunately took the walker home and cleaned it up. But when she heard that Shannon had disappeared and the walker was with her that day, she immediately let police know that she had taken the walker from the curb and where she had found it. A necklace was also found outside of a gas station near the mobile home park that Shannon wanted to visit that day. This necklace, however, has not been confirmed to have belonged to her, but could her killer have thrown the necklace from the car? Did Shannon drop the necklace? Did the necklace have any connection to her at all? Most people close to the case don't seem to believe that she was ever at the gas station that day. Police at the time had been looking for a red Jeep Wrangler with a soft black top and a white unknown sedan with a braided license plate frame. There was a child who talked about a man who spoke to Shannon that day with a distinctive mole on his face. She said that Shannon was familiar with him, but didn't introduce him, and that they saw that white car dirty nearby when they were talking. The man the police are looking for is a white male believed to be between the ages of 35 and 45 with hazel eyes. That's the drawing that we aired in our newscast in 2001. Investigators now say this drawing that they had used for 16 years is wrong. We determined through those grand jury interviews that the composite drawings that were originally done are not reliable. The drawing was based off of testimony from children at the time who were now adults. They, they believed they were helping, okay, but they were inaccurate in when they saw what they saw. And they knew that at the time, but because of their belief, they thought it was the truth or they thought that this was important. An inaccuracy now leading investigators back to square one. 
Yes, it's very frustrating, and it's a, it's a lot more difficult. I mean, we're talking about 16 years have passed. I mean, the, the, the killer, may, may have already, may, he may be dead already. When Shannon's mother returned home from work around 2.30, Shannon was still not home. But this was still not a concern yet. Her mom ran up to the store real quick and bought Shannon a surprise. She knew that she spent time with neighbors, so it was likely that she was at someone's house. However, when she came home and started to make dinner around 6.30, her mother really started to worry about her. Because it was not like her to not be home by now. So around 7, 7.30, Marie sent Shannon's sister, Lisa, around to knock on doors to ask for her. But she wasn't finding her at anyone's house that they could think of. Around 8.30, Marie called Shannon's father. He was supposed to be picking her up the next morning, but he hadn't heard anything. Around 8.45, Shannon's aunts and uncles started showing up because they wanted to help look for her. But there was no sign of her. And Marie was really starting to panic. So around 9 o'clock, the police were finally called. And at first, most people thought that she had just gotten lost in the woods or something and couldn't find her way home. There's a creek in a forest nearby. There's plenty of places for a kid to get themselves into trouble. Police came and talked to everyone and took some statements according to one neighbor. But that neighbor said that they had gotten another call and had to leave. So the first night, police were not taking it that seriously. Shannon's aunt talks about a checkpoint of some kind at the entrance to the mobile home park on the night of Shannon's disappearance, where the police were stopping cars that were coming in and asking them questions about Shannon. However, the other neighbors did not mention this on the first night, but reported police leaving on the first night. So around 10 o'clock, neighbors started going door to door to places where Shannon was familiar. They tried to do their own search for her. They knocked on everyone's door. And one of the only people who took a long time to answer, and when he finally opened the door and was only cracked, was a man referred to as the Root Beer Man. And we'll talk about why he has this name later on. But he was not concerned. He told the neighbors that he hadn't seen her and she was probably just out getting candy. Which is a strange thing to say, considering it was now 10 o'clock at night and Shannon is 11 years old. She's not going to run up to the gas station for candy at that age. He also told other neighbors the next day that she probably just went to somebody's house. This man would never join the search. There was also another man who would not join the search. And when neighbors were searching near his yard, he was outside, but he never even raised his head or asked about her. Even though he knew Shannon very well, he was not concerned at all. This man's name is Ty Foster, which we'll talk more about him also later. But his children would play with Shannon a lot. They were all around similar ages, so she had been over to his home many times and his lack of concern was noticeable. The next day was still no sign of Shannon. The police show up again that evening and they're taking the situation much more seriously this time. But the days went on and there was still no sign of her. And within a few days, the state police came and even the FBI came out to look for Shannon. At one point, a man with a dog trained in search and rescue contacted Shannon's family and told them that he would like to help them. Her father said that the dog took some of Shannon's clothing from her room and followed that scent right over to the root beer man's house where that dog stayed for 45 minutes. They really wanted under that man's trailer. 
But when they finally got the dog off of that scent, he followed that scent over to the railroad tracks, all the way over to County Road 4, and ends at Bubba's Gravel. But this, too, would lead nowhere. Sixty days later, on October 6th, about 15 miles north of Prattville, two hunters were hunting for rabbits in a wooded area when their dog kept trying to get their attention to lead them to a place they'd been curious about the whole day. They were about to leave, but the hunters said that their truck wouldn't start. They thought it was a sign that they were supposed to listen to the dogs. And they came upon what first only appeared to be trash of some kind. But the hunters quickly realized that it was a body. It was a body of a young girl who had obviously been murdered and left here. She had been tied with rope, put inside of a trash bag, and was found with her underwear around her head. The hunting area was about to be plowed in the coming days, so it was incredibly crucial that those hunters found her that day. But after she was found, the town was shocked. Everybody wanted to know, and they needed to know, who could do such a terrible thing, such a kind and trusting little girl, especially in such a small community. Was it someone that everyone knew? Was it someone that no one knew? The mobile home park was never the same. The FBI released a profile of a possible suspect shortly after her body was discovered. And they described the suspect as likely being a white male who's a loner or a person who lives on the margins of society with a menial job who may have changed his appearance during that time. Shaved, cut his hair, grown his facial hair, may have been irritable or especially anxious around the time of her murder or when her body was discovered. They may have left town around her murder for a strange reason or for no reason at all. He may have paid close attention to the coverage of her case in the media. And Shannon was found in a community hunting area in a pretty remote spot. And they were likely very familiar with this hunting area. So the likelihood that they were from Prattville or nearby is very high. This profile was made perhaps under the assumption that the information they were getting from that little girl that day was true. They thought that they would be looking for an older male, possibly around 35 to 45 years old. After recent grand jury findings, the killer may not have been in that age range, and he may not have necessarily exhibited some of these signs, especially if the sketch was wrong. They would have little reason to change their appearance at all if the sketch wasn't even of them. There was a report released in 2006 from Attorney General of Washington, Rob McKenna, that was a follow-up to a 1997 report that reviewed more than 600 child abduction homicides. In this report, they added an additional 175 solved cases to this original data set. But this report found that the average victim 
of child abduction homicide is an 11 year old female. And the average age of the killer is around 27 years old. The majority of these killers are young men between 18 and 30 years old. And 40 year olds only make about 10% of child abduction killers. The most common post-defense behavior of the killer is actually to return to the body disposal site in the coming days and until it is discovered. Only about 14% followed the case in the media, 16% left town, and an equal 16% actually confided in someone about what they had done. Most killers were living with someone else during the time of the killing. So they could be considered loners, but 33% of killers were actually living with their parents when they committed the crime. And approximately half of child abduction murderers were unemployed at the time of the murder. But if employed, they were employed in low skill labor that was low paying. The most common occupation was a construction worker. The likelihood that the killer is a stranger is about 44%. A friend or an acquaintance, 41%. But the age range 10 to 12 was the age range in which female victims were most likely to be abducted by a stranger. However, if this is a serial killer, then the chances of them being a stranger increases to an astounding 71%. There's a whole chapter about series cases in this report. There's some criteria to look for when considering if a serial child killer is at work. Alarmingly, if this is a series killer, then it's likely they have committed prior crimes against children, an astounding 76% of them have a history of this. A lot of these priors were violent crimes. The binding of the victim and the gender of the victim can be some of the best indicators of a serial child murderer. If they are a serial child killer, then they bind their victims 38% of the time. There's no indication that these cases are connected, but there is a popular theory that we're going to discuss later, that these two other 11-year-olds who were abducted not far from where Shannon was are connected in some way. One was never found, while the other was found three years later under an abandoned home. Heavenly Shea Ross was abducted in Northport, Alabama, which is connected to Prattville via Highway 82. She was abducted from her trailer park on her way to the bus stop almost exactly two years after Shannon. And when you consider that only about a hundred of these horrific cases of child abduction homicide occur each year, the fact that these were close in time and location is something to think about. However, something else to consider is that there is an alarming number of sex offenders in Central Alabama. This map you're looking at is the current 2021 map of Prattville. This is just one area in Central Alabama. Back then, it was not this bad. There were about 38 offenders living in the area during the time that Shannon disappeared. Three specifically in Shannon's mobile home park. Police say that when sex offenders live so close together, it makes the task of finding and convicting cases that much harder. They tend to close ranks, provide alibis to each other, share materials with each other, and more. One of the most difficult things about investigating Shannon's case has been that so many suspects live nearby. Polly Perrette of NCIS fame had put out a reward for anyone providing information that led to the arrest of a suspect in Shannon's case. She has ties to Alabama, specifically to Prattville. She wants to find answers and was offering a $10,000 reward for someone who could help solve the case. Now keep in mind, this was 15 years ago, so this reward may have expired by now. Who is this monster? Neighbors have their theories, and many of them point the finger at a neighbor who is known to be inappropriate with children. 
and was later arrested on over a hundred counts of illegal child photography. And this was the Root Beer Man. He was called the Root Beer Man because he would lure children into his home by offering them root beer and candy. He would then take illegal photos of them. This man's charges cannot be found if you Google his name. Luckily, on the Justice for Shannon Polk Facebook page, one of Shannon's relatives has saved local newspaper clippings from when he was arrested. Most of the neighbors don't seem to think it was an outsider, though, that took Shannon. Most of the neighbors believe that an unknown vehicle in the park would have been noticed. They think that the neighbors would have called and told each other. They were all hanging out on their porches that day. Most of them were home. Nobody heard anything. The dad who left for work early was actually a Prattville police officer. Surely he would have noticed any strange vehicles, but he didn't. And some of the neighbors have even been looking at this man a little funny for the last 20 years. He was reportedly reprimanded not long after Shannon disappeared. The officer allegedly told his family not to speak to anyone about Shannon missing. Ty Foster was arrested and pled guilty years ago to assault and sodomy with a minor. The victim was believed to be around nine years old. The police also did a thorough search of his home where they said they found traces of Shannon's blood. Now, Shannon's parents do confirm she would get nosebleeds but don't necessarily remember her having one over at the Foster home. But it was well known that the two creeps to look at first in that park was Ty Foster and the Root Beer Man. The people who have been looking into her case recently seem to believe that the police have some kind of mitochondrial DNA. They've been able to clear several suspects who really look like they could fit the profile of the person who did this. However, no one has ever been charged. Could it be a serial killer? There was an article published in 2006 that talked about Shannon's case possibly being linked to two other murders committed against two other 11-year-old girls in mobile home parks in the South. They also pointed out that there was a major commercial construction or road work or a bridge being built nearby in all of these cases. The cases that this article is referring to are the cases of Heaven Lachey Ross in Northport, Alabama and Teresa Melissa Dean in Twiggs County near Macon, Georgia. Shannon Polk disappeared two years and a day after Teresa Dean, and Heaven Ross was taken two years and three days after Shannon. Heaven Lachey Ross was walking to the bus stop for school on a stormy summer morning in 2003. This past summer, Dateline got exclusive access to an investigation in Northport, Alabama, as police searched for an 11-year-old girl. I believe somebody grabbed my baby and took her from Miss Trotter Park. What happened to little Heaven Lachey Ross is so mysterious, it is still hard for her mother, Beth Lowry, to believe it really happened. My baby came up missing three minutes and we knew she was missing. On the morning of August 19th, Shay grabbed her backpack and headed out to the school bus stop. As she left home, the sky raged. Knowing how afraid Shay is of storms, Kevin Thompson, her stepfather, says he rushed out to drive Shay and her sister himself. And when I got to the bus stop, she had never made it there. He said, she's not at the bus stop. And I got up and put my clothes on and I told him to just call the police. In only minutes, Shay had vanished. Terry Carroll, an investigator with the Northport Police Department, led the special task force trying to find the 11-year-old. Woman over here in this in this trailer here sees her and watches her walk for a couple of trailers. 
And then she loses sight of her. Guy number nine down here, he sees the older sister walk by, but doesn't see the younger sister walk by. And so by the time between between these trailers here, you know, in this area right there, you've lost her. I mean, she's she's gone. Helicopters searched from above. Smell it. Come on, work it. And dogs searched on the ground. You know, anyone could have picked her up, any pedophile, any, you know, anybody. And, you know, we never find Three years and three months later, Shay's remains were found beneath an abandoned home on Creek Road in Holt. No one has ever been charged in her disappearance or death. It's like day one, 15 years later. A task force was formed to investigate the case between the Northport Police Department, Tuscaloosa Metro Homicide Unit, and the FBI. The unsolved case still haunts them as well. Every day, every day. And, you know, I'm not too far from retirement, and, you know, I, I was hoping that it would be solved before then, certainly. Teresa Melissa Dean was last seen walking to a friend's home not far from her own on the 15th of August, 1999. So if this is a series killer, then this would have been one of their first. So while you can find Twiggs County Sheriff Dara Mitchum here in the office, going over what he calls one of the most puzzling cases he had. back in there. Although he wasn't sheriff at the time, Mitchum says he's as caught up as can be in the search for Teresa Dean. The 11-year-old hasn't been seen since mid-August 1999. We continue to run down every possibility. You know, you like to think that something like that is possible because, you know, you if you look back, I mean, there's people that have escaped from prison and live out the rest of their life until they die of old age. The county's chief investigator remembers getting the call. A mother frantically looking for her child. Drove up and spoke with uh, Dorothy Dean, Teresa's mother, and she was kind of frantic a little bit, stated that her daughter had left and went down to a friend's house earlier in the evening and never showed up back home. The last time anyone saw Teresa, she was walking along Lawrence Drive. She lived just down the street. And investigators say it seems as though she disappeared. Deputies say it wasn't unusual for Teresa to make that walk. Investigators didn't waste any time interviewing possible witnesses. Going back through the uh, volumes of case files, there were several, several people that were uh, polygraphed and interviewed uh, during the uh, early stages of the uh, investigation before my time. Nothing. Not one person saw what happened to Teresa. We gridded, uh, done a grid of the whole neighborhood of where she lived and, and a perimeter on the outside of that probably within about a five mile radius surrounding uh, the neighborhood that she lived in. The Sheriff's Office received help from the Georgia and Federal Bureaus of Investigation on the ground, in the air, and searching in nearby bodies of water. No clues. Her picture is still on the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's website, along with an age progression rendering. Ironically, we still get information from time to time from people uh, that say uh, that they knew of some of her family or were friends with some of the family. Leads that ended up running cold. There are some good reasons to believe that these cases could be connected. It sounds like the theory that someone who did this to Shannon had done it before and would do it again was a good theory. However, there does not seem to be any movement on those cases either. Ultimately, it's still a mystery what happened to Shannon that day. And it's a tragedy that it's likely whoever did this to Shannon has victimized others and they're still out there living life like some kind of normal person. The grand jury asked for more time to review all of the evidence in this case back in 2018. The most significant finding being that the famous sketch is no longer credible. They said they needed more time, and it's been two years since they came together, with still no further development so far. But if there's any new information about the case, I'll make sure to keep you updated. In the meantime, 
your support for justice for Shannon, for heaven, for Teresa, your awareness of their cases means everything. So their stories deserve to be told and to be heard. Their families deserve closure and they deserve justice. Whoever committed these horrible crimes deserves to have their name revealed and to be known for the monster that they are. When you talk to people about Shannon, I can't. You can't talk to anybody else. I have people try to talk to me all the time about her. It just tears me up inside. I just can't. One thing that helps him feel close to her, a tree planted in Shannon's memory. Just about every time I come to travel, I go to the park. I take my two youngest granddaughters down there. They go down. They clean off the head stone at the tree. We sit there and talk. Yes, it, it was a little bitty tree when it's planted. It's a good size tree now. Monday, I'm going to have to come up here and go to the can't see her in person. I got to go to the cemetery to visit, some, to visit my daughter. And, and that's not right. I should be able to go to spend time with my daughter on her birthday and not go to the cemetery and spend time with her. Most people still think of Shannon as that 11-year-old girl, but in reality, she's only one year younger than myself. Olivia D. Thanks for watching. Consider liking the video and subscribing to help the channel. Until next time, stay safe out there.